Okay, so imperialism is popularly understood to mean having an aggressive, warlike, expansionist uh, policy, probably emanating from a racist ideology. Um, but this is fundamentally an idealist explanation. It's the same as the position that explains war. You know, war is down to sort of being aggressive and we just need to learn a better way to be. These are idealist explanations. They don't really explain anything. They don't explain, well, if this is such a policy, why does it come to dominate at this time? Why does it dominate this country? Why does this country manage to apply an imperialist policy over other countries? Also, of course, that kind of more unscientific description of imperialism could, of course, accurately be ascribed um, applied to ancient Rome, for example, or many other societies, pre-capitalist societies that have existed. And of course, in a certain sense, they certainly were imperialist. But there's clearly a profound difference between imperialism under capitalism and the imperialism of ancient societies. Also, we need to have a very rigorous and scientific understanding of imperialism, because if we just have this kind of if we just say it's an attitude, a worldview, and a policy, then we might, for example, have to conclude that today we don't really live in, in an imperialist epoch. Because, of course, today mainstream politicians will profess not to be racist. Well, they don't generally have colonies, um, certainly not official colonies. So you'd be forgiven for thinking that, well, really, that's a thing of the past. But of course, we think, uh, and I think there's plenty of evidence, that we clearly do live in an imperialist epoch. So we need a deeper and a materialist scientific uh, explanation of, of, of imperialism and war at a fundamental level. And our starting point, of course, is the laws of capitalist development, not the desires of politicians. Imperialism is, as you probably know, as Lenin uh, explains, the highest and final stage of capitalism. And in his masterpiece, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, clues in the title, he said that it is based on the development of capitalism to the point of monopoly, to the monopolization of, of the capitalist economy. Now, originally capitalism, when it emerged under feudalism, uh, was largely based on free competition, small scale production with small scale tools, basically. Of course, under feudalism, you had capitalists uh, and they you know, created a, a bourgeois revolution. But at the time, there wasn't, for example, there weren't factories. Bourgeois revolutions, the classical ones, took place before the Industrial Revolution. So production, and le even into the 19th century, production was on a relatively small level in comparison, certainly, to today. And capitalist companies were generally relatively small and competed with one another relatively freely. Of course, plenty of exceptions to the rule. There were favoured monopolies um, in some examples, like such as the East India Company, but generally that was the picture of capitalism. Um, but of course, as capitalism developed through the medium of competition, uh, different companies were eliminated, different, you know, they were outcompeted, bought up, etc. Companies gradually accumulated more capital, they got larger and larger. Um, and as, as they developed, they started particularly to expand beyond the home market, in other words, to export commodities to other countries. Because the home market was too small for these larger firms, really. They, they could produce in excess of what the home market could absorb. And by the late 19th century, um, just before Lenin was writing, essentially, you have the emergence of uh, monopolies as a sort of systematic uh, feature of the capitalist economy, certainly in the countries like Britain and France. Um, that is, you know, large, very large uh, companies that dominated or just a few handful of companies beginning to dominate key industries, maybe even more than one industry, and subordinating other companies to themselves. Um, and that really is the beginning of the basis for imperialism. And with the creation of these gigantic monopolies, um, through, as again, again, through competition, in other words, the companies competing with one, more successful ones taking over the other ones, a barrier is created to that very competition that created these monopolies because these monopolies accumulate vast amounts of capital 
Uh, they become highly efficient. They are themselves planned uh, within themselves. They don't have a market within, you know, within that company. That company plans very meticulously their production. They're very effective uh, and efficient. They, produce, they employ, of course, more advanced technology at a larger scale than others. And thus there's a barrier to entry because you, know, you can't really realistically start up a company and hope to compete with one of these gigantic uh, corporations. Um, and therefore, dialectically, competi competition brings about its own negation. The, we have the monopoly era of cap capitalism in which competition, of course, it still exists, but it is, it is kind of curtailed, it's restricted. Um, and these vast corporations that you have emerging at that time, and it's particularly at the beginning of the 20th century, they begin to accumulate an excess of capital, right? Uh, or a surplus of capital that they need to do something with. They can't basically invest all of that capital that they have in their home market. It's not profitable, it's not viable. And so they begin to seek new markets for themselves in other countries, and in particular, more uh, profitable markets. So they export their capital, in other words. That is to say, they set up um, factories uh, or other kinds of uh, productive places in other countries where the labor is cheaper, you know, uh, where probably working class didn't even really exist uh, before, was only just coming into existence. And that working class, of course, their wages are lower, so they can, ex they can exploit those workers even more intensively using the latest highly developed production, but in, uh, paying these workers far lower wages than in the home markets. And we can see that kind of situation clearly today where you have these gigantic monopolies like Apple who just have far too much money, basically. They're cap they have too much capital. They don't even know what to do with it. Um, they have hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that is really idle. And they're always seeking for somewhere to invest it profitably and they bestride the world, basically. Um, <clears throat> and that Lenin identified as the really the key or one of the two or three key characteristics of imperialism that is to say not just the export of commodities i.e selling what you've produced at home to other countries but the export of capital building factories and other workplaces in other countries where the labor is cheaper uh, he says that this signifies and i quote that capital has become overripe and owing to the backward state of agriculture and the poverty of the masses Capital cannot find a field for profitable investment, hence it going to other countries, trying to open up new markets for itself. And in that book, Imperialism, Lenin gives uh, uh, you know, reams of, of, of factual evidence to show how this was the case and how concentrated capital had become in a few key firms. He shows how these firms not only are very, you know, they, they employ a disproportionately large number of people, but even that understates their economic weight because the, they might employ 20% of the workforce, just a few companies, but the amount of wealth that they produce, the value that they produce is in excess of that because they're the more productive companies, essentially. Um, so that is an absolutely key characteristic of, of um, imperialism it's based on monopolization and with that the export of capital that's the that's the sort of impetus for creating colonies essentially uh, to protect those that those exports uh, of capital um, and now this situation in other words this um, economic foundation to imperialism is even clearer even more pronounced today than it was a hundred years ago for example in 2011 a group of scientists constructed a model of which companies controlled other companies through shareholding networks, coupled with their operating venues to map a set of structure of global corporate power. Because of course you have to bear in mind, a lot of companies, they own bits of other companies. They may not of officially you know, uh, own that other company, may only own 10% of its shares, for example. Um, anyway, their, their study revealed a core of 1,318 companies on the global, in the global economy, each of those companies having two or more ties to other companies. And on average, they were actually connected to 20 other companies. These, this 1,318 companies, their own revenues accounted for 20% of global revenues, but they appear to collectively own through their, you know, small bits of ownership of other firms, um, 
through their shares, basically, the, the ownership of shares in other firms. They represented, if you took that into account, 60% of global revenues, just 1,318 firms on the global stage. However, further, they found a super entity, as they called it, of just 147 t more tightly knit companies that, that of this, um, this, this uh, 1,318 companies, this 147 controlled 40% of that. Um, so within that 1,300, there's, there's, there, even within that, there are dominating much bigger companies than the rest of that 1,300. Saying, they said, in effect, less than 1% of the companies were able to control 40% of the entire network. And it, very importantly, most of these 147 firms were financial institutions. <clears throat> In industry after industry, we find today a, a, a tiny handful of firms completely dominate the market. So I'll just give some examples. Amazon sells 74% of all ebooks and 64% of all printed books online. There are only three major liquor companies that own all of the other ones Suntory, Diageo, and Perno Ricard. By the way, if you're interested in, for example, you know, um, Scottish whiskies, you, you might sometimes be astounded at how many different Scottish whiskies there are. If you go to, you know, the, um, in, the, in the airport and you have a look at the duty-free, they're basically all owned by Diageo. They appear to be different distilleries. They're actually all owned by one firm. That is normal in, in the modern economy. We have the same thing with sunglasses, which are dominated by Luxottica. For example, Luxottica owns both Ray-Ban and Oakley. Uh, Google and Facebook together claim 64% of all internet advertisement revenues. Um, and the, I forget what it's called, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturer Company or something like that. They could manufacture about 60 to 80% of all of the world's um, semiconductors, that is the, the microprocessors that you get in, in, in all devices. So you can see that today there is an ev a more extreme concentration of capital, globally speaking, than there has ever been before. Lenin uh, added then that this uh, monopoly capital, which is a key uh, element, um, as it concentrates itself more and more into fewer and fewer firms, uh, it, it is also concentrated of those firms into the financial institutions which dominate the rest of the economy. And you have the stock markets and other financial institutions, you know, private equity, hedge funds, things like that, which become a kind of nerve center for global capitalism. Nothing can really happen without these, these companies, how they have their fingers in every pie um, and they dominate everything, right? Which is why the global financial crisis was so devastating. Um, and with this, finally, he says, the, key, uh, the final key aspect of or the, the economic basis for imperialism is not just the domination of these financial firms, but their close interweaving with the bourgeois state through things like, like the stock market and the central bank. The bourgeois state kind of is, is very closely tied up with these, these dominating financial firms uh, and, and other monopolies. And so we have a kind of position where you have these national champions which are protected by the bourgeois state and are used to further the interests of that bourgeois state. And in turn, that bourgeois state protects their interests globally, of course. Um, and therefore we have, the, as I said, the negation of the era of free competition, gigantic state-backed monopolies that bestride the world market. Um, and of course, anti-competitive practices between these, these corporations. And just as um, they, they, their, their accumulation of capital becomes a barrier to, to competitors, you know, new competitors just can't hope to compete. Um, similarly, on the, on the arena of geopolitics, which of course is a key aspect of imperialism, you have imperial blocks forming, which also kind of block off parts of the world economy from one, other, one another and prevent the development of, uh, of, um, of other countries. Lenin says uh, that the world is divided up uh, into a, a system of colonies, or in today's language, alliances, um, which he says obliges those contemplating a redivision to reach out for every kind of territory, and of course, ultimately, war. Um, <clears throat> and this also means that the maintenance of this system is thoroughly, thoroughly reactionary. Um, the imperialist system 
uh, signifies really that capitalism has become ripe for its overthrow. You have these gigantic firms, which are really, although they still uh, are, the profits are privately appropriated uh, and there's no overall plan to the system, they are themselves nevertheless, um, you know, the production is social now, you know, uh, and in fact, the whole world economy really is one gigantic economy of, of uh, uh, interdependent labor, you know, where everything that happens is dependent upon stuff that happens all over the world. So we live in an era that allegedly capitalism is all about private, you know, the private individual and every, the individual getting ahead. In reality, the, the world economy is socially organized to a very, very um, thorough extent. Uh, but imperialism doesn't recognize that fact. There was uh, Kautsky uh, who put forward the theory of super imperialism or ultra imperialism, I forget what, what it was, uh, which was this ridiculous idea that imperialism would sort of almost recognize the fact that um, social production was the case and would just sort of gradually grow over into there just being one gigantic imperialist and one gigantic monopoly which would plan all of production and essentially would just be the realization of socialism in a kind of automatic sense, which of course is, is ridiculous because imperialism prevents that development, in fact. Um, it is the realization of that final stage of capitalism, but it also prevents the development of other firms and of other countries. Um, and of course, the nation state uh, is one of the key fetters um, it, uh, that capitalism has, it, along with private private ownership in the means of production that it hold, is holding humanity back. So with, it, with the development of imperialism, of course, you have a system of alliances of imperialist countries uh, that don't just sort of sit by and allow other countries to develop uh, and, and to outcompete them uh, or share around the wealth of, of, of their plunder, but instead jealously guard it and protect it, which of course is something that we'll discuss later on in the talk today. Um, <clears throat> And monopolization itself also becomes a fetter. Um, it doesn't just naturally grow over into the negation of private property in which, you know, we all just sort of collectively work for these gigantic companies and, and actually run them democratically to meet human needs. Of course, that doesn't happen. Um, and these monopolies actually hold back the development of the forces of production for the sake of their own profits out of greed, essentially. That's why you see these attempts, for example, to sometimes to break up, you know, you have these anti-monopoly court cases where Google or some other company will get taken to court because the, the, uh, the strategists of capital are worried that these gigantic monopolies actually provide a disincentive for the development of the means of production. They, they represent a kind of crowning achievement of capitalism up to a certain stage, stage of development, if you like, and then a kind of a stopping there and, and actually even a regression in some cases. Because why bother to, to invest what, if you already dominate the world market and you have no real competitors? And that is one of the key problems of the modern bourgeois economy, essentially. Um, and yes, I hinted at it before, but the, de the development of imperialism in terms of politics holds back the development of other countries. It's not as if when you have the imperialist, the emergence of imperialist powers meddling in other countries and opening up the markets of other countries. It's not as if what the imperialists of that country do is say, oh, well, we had a bourgeois revolution 200 years ago. So I think you ought to have a bourgeois revolution and we'll nurture a capitalist class and allow you to develop just like we did. Of course they don't. They actually exploit those countries and keep them in a state of backwardness in many cases. And in many cases, even intervene in their politics to prevent, uh, for example, a revolution, a democratic revolution from taking place because it suits those countries just well. They don't want to see the development of the rest of the world. They want to dominate the rest of the world. Um, and that's why you see these countries in perpetual debt bondage, which is really the modern form really of colonialism in the main, where, where countries all over the world, um, developing countries as they call them, constantly pay back um, to the, the dominator, the banks, the, the gigantic bank, banking institutions of the imperialist countries, more and more in interest uh, and keeping these countries in a state of poverty and backwardness. Um, one last aspect, I think, of imperialism I would like to highlight on the, on the political rather than the economic plane uh, is the um, emergence of social chauvinism, which is an important characteristic that Lenin also identifies in the same book. In fact, he quotes, I think it's Cecil Rhodes he quotes, who is, of course, an arch-British imperialism and is often now the subject of these 
you know, struggles to get statues of him taken down. Um, uh, he was obviously extremely racist. Um, and he, there's a quote that Lenin, Lenin quotes him going to, I think, a workers' meeting in London where workers are extremely uh, angry about their wages and the lack, lack of money they have to buy things to eat. And he, say, he says he was alarmed by this and he saw the value and the importance in having an empire because basically we can give crumbs to these workers and stop them from revolting is essentially what he says. And now some people, of course, conclude from this that the Western working class is bought off and actually benefits from imperialism, which is the opposite of the case. It is precisely the giving of crumbs, uh, particularly to the top layers of the working class in countries like Britain and America, uh, that it, it actually is used to keep the working class there from revolting, if you like, and overthrowing capitalism, which of course is in their interests. So they use these, this, these sort of crumbs to keep us actually uh, in, in, a, in a position of exploitation. But that's an important aspect of imperialism. And again, you can see that today, despite the apparent ending of, of colonialism and imperialism. You can see it in America, where the decline of American imperialism is leading to a very clear decline in you know, the, the, uh, the conditions of the American working class and uh, a breakdown in the political setup of the American working class, where they, they would vote for the Democrats and the trade unions would give the Democrats some money. That's exactly also what we saw in Britain with the decline of British imperialism, where, you know, the British, uh, where the, the working class basically broke from the, the Liberal Party and set up the Labour Party. Um, so that's like in a kind of in a negative form, you can see the, the, the uh, existence of social chauvinism, as in when an imperialist power declines, you can see the breakdown in that system um, of, of, um, of social chauvinism. Um, anyway, on to the question of war, which of course is a key aspect of imperialism. Imperialism means war unavoidably, right? To understand why you get war with imperialism, we also have to understand imperialism in a two-sided or in a dialectical fashion. I think what I've said so far, of course, is true. But if we understand that in a one-sided and simplistic fashion, it might seem a bit as though Kautsky was correct. And you shouldn't, have imperial, you shouldn't have war under imperialism because surely you just have the ever increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of one or two dominant powers. And they are so crushingly economically dominant that nobody can even resist. And therefore, why would you even have war? Well, there are phases of imperialism when that kind of almost appears to be the case. But actually, it's, it's a little one-sided to say that imperialism simply holds back the development of other countries. In fact, again, in the same book, Lenin points out that the exporting country, i.e. the imperialist country, makes super profits at the expense of other countries. But on the other hand, he says, the export of capital influences and accelerates the development of capitalism to those countries to which capital is exported. So imperialism does develop other countries. Now, I know I was just saying that it doesn't, that it holds them back. Well, it's a very contradictory and complex process. Um, it largely does arguably hold back other countries, which is why so much of the world continues to exist in a state of extreme poverty. Uh, but you do have invest real investments in other countries. And yes, the development of capitalism in those countries. Now, when you have a, a period of relative peace and prosperity under imperialism in which one imperialist power in particular dominates the world. And there's really two major epochs of that, the, the epoch under British domination and then of course more recently under American domination. When you have that and when there's relative peace on the world stage, you can have a period of prosperity and of growth and it appears for a time as if all of the old horrors of war of chaos, you know, all of that is perhaps put to bed. And now we live in an enlightened era, an era of prosperity, basically, and even of the end of history, right? Which is, of course, what they said in America when the Soviet Union collapsed and when they thought that American power and the American way, i.e. liberal democracy, was just clearly it. That was it forever. When you have a period like that, there's, of course, the appearance of overconfidence in the imperialists. And they invest in other countries and they don't really fear the development of capitalism in other countries. And in particular, what I'm thinking of more recently, of course, is the development of Chinese capitalism, which took place to a large extent 
with the blessing of American imperialism, which of course made a lot of profits out of production uh, taking place within China. Um, <clears throat> but of course, when you have a sustained period of such growth and investment, as we saw from the sort of the 80s through to really more, much more recently with China, you have of course growth, right? But you don't have perfectly even growth taking place all over the world. In fact, growth will typically take place more quickly in the underdeveloped country, which is of course having much more advanced technology being very suddenly imported into its country. And in fact, in many cases, that technology will be even more advanced than exists uh, in the, um, the home country. Lenin again describes how the factories that appeared in certain key cities, and I think Trotsky also makes this point in Results and Prospects, um, that the, you, know, you have the appearance in, 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 in Russia of some of the biggest and most advanced factories in the world. Overall, Russia remained backwards, of course, but you had in certain pockets, particularly in St. Petersburg, um, really advanced uh, production that was probably more advanced than in Britain, for example. Uh, and, and of course, we're all familiar with this. Right? We all look at China, look at it. It's, it's got the most extensive network of high-speed rail in the world. And then we look at our own rail. We can see that, that the, the, the heritage we have from prior development, which is actually becomes kind of a certain amount of baggage, really, that holds, holds the imperialist country back. And actually, Trotsky points out that there is, as he calls it, a privilege of backwardness. In other words, an ability to learn from um, the development of other countries to skip over some economic stages, to skip over certainly stages of technology, and to have a certain, a more planned kind of implementation of capitalism, a more rational implementation of capitalism up to a point. That also happens, right? And we've seen it, undoubtedly. Um, and so as a result, of course, the consequence of a few decades of such uneven growth, and imperialism is always based on unevenness in the world economy, a few decades of that means that, of course, you have after a while, a breakdown in the system of world relations, which reflects the past. And you can see that very clearly today, where America has you know, a vast amount of military power and alliances. China has very, very few, but the Chinese economy has caught up. Um, and I'll come on to that in a moment. And, and what history teaches us from, from such e eras, in other words, eras in which there is a breakdown in the system between the geopolitics, the geo-relations between imperialist powers, is that these periods are very messy, very violent. You know, of course, capitalism is an unplanned, a blind system, not a rational system. There's no super international capitalist state, which is, I suppose, what the UN is trying to be, but it can't be, that basically kind of referees this process and says, well, actually, this new country really is more advanced now, so it deserves some colonies and you know, control of uh, trade routes. Obviously, that doesn't happen. So you have a, a complicated, violent period, like the period of the First and the Second World War in particular. That, that was the, really the great period in which British imperialism declined and was challenged by German and American imperialism, and Japanese imperialism, of course. Um, and uh, it follows from this that imperialist wars have no progressive content whatsoever and are characterized by the processes I've talked about. In other words, the economic processes, the struggle for markets, the struggle for more productive economies to have control over bigger spheres of the world market. That's the basis for imperialist wars, the real basis putting aside what the, the different politicians would obviously claim these wars are about. And such wars obviously have no progressive character whatsoever. They're defined by uh, their imperialist character. Um, now, coming on to today's uh, situation, which, of course, one of the reasons we're discussing this. <coughs> when the USSR collapsed, the US was obviously left as the sole superpower on the world stage. As you know, it was very confident. I've described that very briefly, overconfident. But that confidence also stretched into the left. There were many people on the left who, who were very impressed by this, this domination, and thought, well, that's, you know, there's just one imperialist power now, and um, that's it. There's, you know, there's no, not going to be any changes. You had Hart and Negri, for example, who developed a, a theory somewhat like Kautsky's theory of ultra-imperialism, saying that there was no imperialist power anymore. There was a sort of abstract imperialist power that didn't have any particular location um, uh, because of, I guess institutions like the World Trade Organization and the IMF created this illusion that America didn't actually even dominate 
you know, as a kind of an international agreement. These were obviously illusions that today look very quaint <laughs> in the, the e epoch of, of, of competition, imperial competition that we're clearly in. World capitalism today is a picture of chaos, of rivalry and economic crisis, and clearly has reached a crisis point with the war in Ukraine. And we've been saying for years that there will be proxy, many, many more proxy wars because of the relative decline of US imperialism. And this is bringing into sharp relief many of the aspects of imperialism that perhaps we thought, or many people thought, were finished, were, were a thing of the past. Such as, for example, the intertwining of the state and the, and the key financial institutions. You can see that very clearly with the sanctions that have been applied onto Russia. Very severe sanctions. In particular, I'm thinking of kicking Russian banks out of the SWIFT payment system. I don't know if you remember that happening a few months ago. But the ability to just exclude Russian banks, basically, from all international transactions because of their centralization in just one piece of technology, which is under the domination of US imperialism, that's very clear. Um, and that brings to mind many of the points that Lenin made. <coughs> um, and of course, in particular, what is, is clear is the rise of China and the competition that we can see between the US and China is bringing into relief many of the characteristics of, of imperialism. Now, to be clear, US imperialism remains the dominant imperialist power, and we shouldn't exaggerate the situation which some people get a bit excited about these things, and they like to declare that we now live in a Chinese century uh, and everything's fundamentally changed. Um, the, the United States mil spends more on its military than the next 11 powers combined, including China. And even that actually understates the, 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 the imbalance because many of those 11 countries are also American allies, such as Britain and France. They're in those 11 countries. Britain and France aren't going to go to war with America. They're not even going to have a proxy war with America, right? So to a certain extent, they can almost just be added to the American figure. Um, America has 750 military bases overseas. China has three at most. Um, <clears throat> Russia has a bit more, it has 15 for historical reasons. Now it's true, that, is acting, that, that imbalance is increasingly out of proportion with the economic reality. Uh, because of course American economic weight is nowhere near that dominant. Um, but that's, you know, natural military and political power always tends to lag economic changes, right? Just as consciousness tends to lag behind economic events. We, we, it takes us a while to sort of catch up and accept reality. And of course, America's not just going to accept uh, that it's on the decline and give up. Uh, and, and anyway, the United States economy remains the biggest in the world. Um, its GDP is about 25% of world GDP compared to about 18% for China. Um, China's GDP per capita, which gives you, of course, a figure of the level of economic development, which is also very important, is about $13,000 compared to $74,000 for the United States. So there's a huge difference in terms of the uh, actual economic development. Of course, China has more people. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, US imperialism and its economic power has reached a limit and is clearly on the decline. Whilst its GDP, as I said, is now 25% tw of, of world GDP, it used to, after the Second World War, it was 50%. So it's declined as a proportion by half, which is very important. And this is creating an increasingly unstable world. Um, it's creating all of these proxy wars, for example. And it's not just Ukraine, it's Yemen is another proxy war that is a, is a function of the decline of American imperialism. I don't have time to go into it. Um, but of course, Chinese assertiveness is, is, is the major factor here with its island building in, in, the, in the South China Sea. It's one belt, one road uh, initiative, for example. Um, when the reason, one of the reasons this leads to instability is that American allies or countries that were to largely in America's sphere of influence now feel that they have a, an alternative source of investment and of power. So, for example, you have Saudi Arabia very much doing its own thing, as in, seen in the case in Yemen, and even uh, Israel. And, uh, and that's partly because Saudi Arabia now sells a lot of oil to China. There's many other reasons as well. But that is one factor of it. It has a rival. You know, it doesn't need to just do what America tells it. It can balance between the imperialist powers. And that's creating things like these proxy wars, where it feels it doesn't have to obey American instructions. But of course, also the failures of American imperialism in Iraq and Afghanistan, their inability to intervene in Syria, 
uh, all of these, the, the lack of, also it's a political question, the American working class uh, does not want to go, does not want more imperialist wars. It's, and it's beginning to lose, again, this is a function of the decline of American economic dominance. American working class no longer really believes in the, the American dream and in the, the, the power of the American ruling class, which is having all kinds of strange uh, expressions, such as with Trump. But one way or another, that is also contributing to this sense that other countries have, that America is not going to defend us. You know, if we oppose China, we can't rely on America to defend us. Or if we oppose Russia, we can't rely on America to defend us. Those messages are being read loud and clear and understood by many countries of the world. And therefore, some of them are defying America or they're even thinking about moving into China's sphere of influence. We're seeing the beginning of such a process. For example, in Taiwan, of course, very important for these questions. Um, the the uh, confidence in Taiwan amongst the population that America would intervene to defend them has dropped from 55% a few years ago to 43% today. So most Taiwanese people don't think that America would step in. I'd, I'd be fascinated to see what they have concluded from the war in Ukraine, where America has not intervened. I mean, it's sold weapons, but it has not intervened, has not been able to stop what is happening. Um, there is, I mean, Perhaps, I, I originally wrote this a few weeks ago and I thought at the time it seemed like this was the case, but I think most people have realised now that um, Western unity in the face of the war in Ukraine has declined. But a while ago everyone thought, oh yeah, the, uh, the West is back, NATO is back, you know, we've uh, had a bit of a shock with the, with the war in Ukraine, but that was almost a good thing, it's made us realise how much we share each other's values and how much we'll be prepared to fight for these things. Well, that is really on the decline now in a big way. The EU is fraying. Uh, in Italy in particular, there's a lot of um, uh, disagreement with what's going on, and I don't think that Italy is really... really uh, and there's tensions within Europe over other questions with the economic crisis, the bond payments that Italy has to make, uh, diverging from countries like Germany. So there's a breakup, a break really, of, of that unity. And there's exhaustion already, only a few months into the war, and a lack of interest even, really. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this is having a lot of... Um, and in, in other parts of the world, by the way, it is not, the war in Ukraine is not seen like it is seen in the West. For example, I'll quote The Economist. Particularly across the Middle East and in Turkey, the West's concern for Ukraine's sovereignty is seen as self-serving and hypocritical, partly in light of the war in Iraq and NATO-led bombing of Libya, um, the warm European welcome granted to Ukrainian refugees compared to that accorded Syrian refugees prompts eye-rolling. These sorts of concerns are of long standing among Arab states, but, and I emphasize this last point, what has been surprising is the degree to which even American clients have felt free to act on them. I think Turkey in particular stands out for this. Turkey's in NATO. It's now opposing... Uh, Finland and Sweden joining NATO and is, but is almost acting as a Russian ally in, in this war, certainly at the very least balancing between the two. So you can see very clearly the decline in American domination here. Um, and, um, and, and regarding the war as well, um, uh, the West, of course, has made a lot of who started it and has tried to kind of popularize the position of the war by saying, well, you, Russia is, is terrible. Uh, and is to blame for this, and Russia invaded, and Putin is evil. We mustn't allow ourselves to be sucked into that kind of way of looking at things. One of the key points of, of war, or an imperialist war, is who started it is not the point for us. The character of the war is defined by the major imperialist powers, and is the real cause of the war is imperialism in general and capitalism in general, and the dividing up of the world in this way. And you know, who started it is, even that is, of course, you would say Russia started it, but uh, it's a complicated question. In reality, uh, it's a product of years of, of, of tussling over Ukraine. Ukraine has been bombing parts of, of itself, uh, the breakaway regions, for 14 years. And, sorry, not for 14 years, uh, for, for about eight, eight years. And 14,000 people have died in that process. So you could say, e equally, that Ukraine has started it. And by the way, it's interesting to note how this all started. Um, what actually began the process is that um, in 2013, Ukraine was going to sign some sort of agreement with the EU to be in, in but not in the EU, but to be basically uh, in the EU's sphere of influence. But because of the financial crisis, which was rocking the EU, if you remember, um, Ukraine was only offered a billion 
pound or a billion euros, I think, to sign that agreement in, you know, funds that would be given to help develop the Ukrainian economy. And Russia offered 15 billion, 15 times as much. And that reflects, of course, the, the economic crisis and the decline in the economic heft, if you like, of Western imperialism. They couldn't get their way in Ukraine because of that. And that was the, region that, the, the reason that the then Ukrainian president um, sided basically with, with Russia. Of course, that led to the Maidan movement and all of, the, all of the protests. So even that reflects the meddling, but also the weakness of Western imperialism. Uh, whereas, of course, if, if the West was absolutely dominant and far more economically strong, that whole, the whole thing would never have even started because Ukraine would have just gone uh, to Europe, I think. You, well, at least that would be far more likely. Um, now, I've written down a load of stuff about Chinese imperialism. Um, I don't think I really have time to go into, into its character. And I think it's, it's, um, it's clear for us that it is an imperialist power. But I'll just say that, yes, in our view, China is a capitalist power and it is now an imperialist power. It is exporting capital. You can see that particularly clearly with the One Belt, One Road initiative. But I mean, it's just ever, all the time, there's more evidence of Chinese imperialist behavior, of, of, of it taking a control of ports in other countries, is building military bases in more and more countries. It just held a peace summit uh, in Eastern Africa. Uh, because it, it's the major investor in Africa and it's basically now behaving as a mediator in global conflicts, which is a, uh, a symptom of imperialism, of being a major power. Um, perhaps the most interesting uh, uh, proof, really, of Chinese imperialism is the speculative housing bubble that has appeared in China, which is threatening the whole economy. And I don't know if you remember with Evergrande, this massive uh, property developer is obviously basically bust. Uh, there's a massive speculative bubble in, in the Chinese property sector, which is a sign of an over-accumulation of capital in Chinese capitalism and nowhere profitable for them to invest in. Obviously, they'd like to invest it in other countries, which is what they're trying to do, but there's certain blockages to that because of American imperialism. Um, and American now in, sorry, China now invests more in other countries than is invested in it by other countries. Um, but of course, as Lenin just explained, that imperialism divides the world, it carves the world up into separate spheres of influence and blocks development. And that's the problem that China is facing. It doesn't control the seas around itself. America, the American Navy effectively controls the seas that Chinese trade goes through. America, as I've, I've listed the, the military bases that America has, it basically dominates diplomatically and militarily. And China feels the need to push against that and to win for itself what it sees as its rightful, you know, would just reflect its, its economic development. It's only fair in their eyes. That will lead to decades of instability in Southeast Asia, which is, a, a, you know, East and Southeast Asia have been a source of relative stability and economic growth for world capitalism for quite a long time, right? There's not completely stable, obviously, but in comparison to many other parts of the world, I think that's going to come to an end. What we've seen in Myanmar and Thailand in recent years is partly a product of China and America struggling for influence over those regimes and who is, sits in the saddle in those regimes. Um, uh, it, and we will eventually see countries in Southeast Asia in particular, I think, break away from American influence. At the moment, there was the um, Shangri-La Dialogue or something uh, took place, which is a kind of a regular conference of, of security in East Asia. And America is always there as well. And that just happened the other day. And America was being all belligerent about Taiwan and about how terrible Russia is. And don't you think about being like Russia? And, you know, you might expect the way it's presented here is that countries like Vietnam, the Philippines, they feel bullied by China or this island building that China does. And they're very grateful for American kind of the rules-based international order that America is supposed to enforce. And apparently that, but that wasn't the case, in particular Indonesia, but many of the other countries there, they basically said, we, we're fed up of you two arguing. We just want to trade with both of you and we don't take a side in this. And of course that's the case because their biggest trading partner is China. And sooner or later, you will see the Philippines, quite possibly, or Indonesia, basically become a Chinese uh, ally, if you like, against America. I'm not saying that then what's going to happen is that China will become the global power and America will just, I don't think that's going to happen. But there will be a shift uh, and, and, and we will see a lot of instability. And I don't know if you've been following what's been taking place in, in the 
in the in the Pacific Islands, like the Solomon Islands. But there's this, this is like a little harbinger of it. Obviously, these are much smaller countries, probably easier to basically bribe. Um, but China has essentially won over many of these countries to being in its sphere. And America threatened military uh, repercussions, which is fascinating because they, they, they describe what Russia does in Ukraine is so terrible. You know, Russia meddling in Ukrainian sovereignty because it doesn't like Ukraine looking to the West. Uh, but if, if the Solomon Islands looks towards China, apparently it's okay for America to threaten military consequences. Um, so yes, that, that will be a, an increasingly unstable part of the world, I think. Um, and the last thing I want to tackle is the question of Russian imperialism, uh, which we can see playing out in Ukraine, obviously. But some, some people on the left would say, particularly Stalinists, but not just Stalinists, they would say that... Um, well, Russia's not imperialist. It clearly doesn't meet the criteria of imperialists. Even if, I mean, some of them don't even think it's capitalist, but even those who accept it's capitalist would see it as dominated, as undeveloped. Um, <coughs> and they would say it doesn't export capital. Where are the gigantic Russian corporations dominating the world economy, basically, and investing in other countries? You don't have that. And what they say is it's a kind of parasitic economy, just um, uh, like living off of the, the, the uh, you know, the... Um, uh, the resources of the country, but the oil and the gas and, and, and other minerals. Um, and that, that, that's what allows it to have its relative strength, but it's not, it's not imperialist in the, in, the, in the strict Marxist sense. Um, well, these people sort of like to present themselves as very strict Marxists, but they don't seem to have read Lenin on imperialism, and they don't seem to understand dialectics. Um, because how do we understand a, ca a category like imperialism, dialectically, right? When we say imperialism, is it just a list of features, which admittedly I did more or less list at the beginning. Um, but is that how we should understand imperialism? Is it just a list of features like, well, it must have two arms, two legs, etc.? Um, well, actually, any way of, I mean, that can be a useful way of, of like a shorthand for understanding of something, you know, if you want to understand what an animal is, if it has these features, you say, oh, it's one of those animals. But even that, that doesn't tell you anything about why that animal exists, what its history is, what it evolved from, what its life cycle is. And of course, many animals would belong to that species, but would diverge from and might lack one of the features that that species has. It might be missing a limb, for example. You wouldn't say it's not a member of that species, right? So actually, a far richer way of understanding a category is to look at it dialectically, i.e. the history the, the development of it as a system and to understand the place within that system that the component parts uh, uh, have. World capitalism is, you know, we do have a world economy, i.e. not just an adding up of separate national economies that you, you can kind of aggregate, but actually a system, you know, that dominates the parts. And within that, of course, the different capitalist economies are different precisely because they're part of that system. Some of them specialize in some part of the economy and others in another. They play different roles within the system and that binds them together. It's precisely the fact that they don't play the entire role that makes them dependent upon one another. That's how we should understand, if you like, uh, a category and that's how we should understand the world economy. So imperialism too is a system and it doesn't mean that every imperialist power that is participating in that system has to have 100 percent of the features the classical features of imperialism russia is a bit of an outlier it's true it doesn't export much capital but actually lenin in imperialism defines czarist russia as imperialist although he therefore points out that at that time it was actually a dominated country it had the features of a country that is dominated but it has capital exported to it or rather it imports capital which is the opposite of imperialism but he just defined it as imperialist because it participated in the world stage in that way. Russia today is very similar to that. And it, is a it sort of punches above its economic weight because of its geography, its vastness and its resources, um, its history and its inheritance of a massive military and a sphere of influence from the former Soviet countries. Um, and, um, and the fact that there are Russian-speaking minorities in a lot of other countries that enables it to play this important role on the world stage. Even the fact that it sits on the UN Security Council for historical reasons obviously helps it. Um, so yes, it isn't classically imperialist, but it is participating in the imperialist system as, and, and therefore is obliged to behave in an imperialist manner in order to compete. 
Plus, we should only go so far in saying it's not in economically imperialist. It is a capitalist economy, and it does export capital. For example, Spurbank, the biggest Russian bank, invests all over the world. Uh, for example, it brokered the merger between Renault and Nissan. It's actually the largest bank in Eastern Europe and the third biggest bank in Europe overall. It acquired the Austrian bank Volksbank in 2011 and the Turkish bank Denizbank in 2012. So it's, it's not a dominating economically imperialist power, but it does have aspects of it. Whereas Russia, uh, sorry, the Soviet Union, being a planned economy, of course, it also had to compete with imperialists on the world stage and in some respects behaved a bit like an imperialist. But because it was a planned economy, uh, it didn't behave economically in that way. So when it signed deals with, you, with uh, Cuba, for example, in many cases, it actually subsidized other economies, it actually subsidized the, the Cuban economy in order to win for itself an ally. It, didn't it had no incentive to economically exploit Cuba in the way that it would if it's a capitalist economy. But Russia today isn't like that, right? It does exploit other countries where it can. Anyway, I'll just sum up that the, we know from history, as I mentioned before, that when the epoch of the domination of one imperialist superpower comes to an end, as it is clearly is now, that means an epoch of crisis, it means an epoch of instability, of, of bigger economic crises as well. We can see that clearly with the protectionism that's rising, the, dis, the, the, you know, the, the breaking up almost of the world economy into separate blocks, um, the competition over countries, the war, all of this, we will see more of it, just as we saw in the previous equivalent period really, i.e. Uh, the early 20th century. But with that, we'll get revolution, right? Such an epoch will always bring with it the, the, the disturbance, the breakdown of, 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 of you know, social chauvinism and, and, and things like that, and the, the sort of the breaking up of conservatism and routinism even. That will tend to encourage revolutionary developments throughout the world. I was just reading an article in The Economist today talking about how global unrest is on the rise. They did many ways of measuring it, both in the language used in the press, the numbers of protests, how violent the protests were, how many regimes have been toppled. They said it's on the rise and that's only going to increase because of the war in Ukraine and the inflation. Look at the strikes we're seeing in Britain. Look at Corbyn being elected leader of the Labour Party. Of course, that's over now, but that signifies that was a very important thing. So we have moved, in, already have moved into a period of war, crisis and revolution. And the war in Ukraine is a harbinger of many more things like that to come. And it's a proof of the fundamentally reactionary character of capitalism and imperialism. And therefore, we have to utilize these revolutions to overthrow that system once and for all.